some, some of us uh, dread. I have to say that uh, uh, Louis' introduction is not of that kind. <laughs> I, kind I just want her to keep talking and talking. Uh, unfortunately, she chose to, uh, to stop, uh, for which uh, I'm also, uh, as I imagine you are, uh, very grateful. Uh, uh, somebody, I think it was, it was uh, uh, Daniel or somebody else, I said, oh, so you came to, to give us the final word. And I said, the conference is about to, to end. Uh, certainly not. Uh, I wasn't here for the first word, uh, which disqualifies me uh, automatically for, for giving any kind of uh, final word. I would like to say thank you to, to Louise and of course to Sean. Uh, I don't know whether he's in the room. And, and his department is, is somewhere there. Uh, for, for the invitation, for what I hear has been a, an extremely successful intellectual uh, encounter of the kind we, uh, we want this university uh, to keep uh, getting uh, involved in. So, first of all, I have no specific faces uh, to defend. Uh, rather, I would like to share uh, a set of uh, uh, really anxieties uh, both political anxieties and intellectual anxieties concerning uh, the times we live in. <clears throat> How is it that we read uh, these times? How do we describe them? How do we interpret them? What name it is that we, we give to these moment of ours? Um, or issues which are, of course, part of uh, the uh, very classical tradition of, of criticism, whether in philosophy uh, or, or in literature. How, how to read, what is it that we read, uh, are part of uh, that broader issue of deciphering one's own times. And that the, uh, the, uh, to some extent, the, uh, the, uh, the main purpose of critique is to be able to say what time is it. So, the anxieties I'm going to share with you have to do precisely uh, with that. Now, if you want, the question I'm asking is whether in accounting for the times we live in, whether we'll keep uh, trying to produce stories on the basis of some kind of uh, unified, almost theological singularity, or whether we'll rather choose to produce what we should call open-ended stories. Whether we will come to the realization that maybe stories with some degree of uh, uh, narrative plurality a uh, better place to account for the kind of uh, chaotic novel our times are. And um, you probably heard uh, what happened yesterday uh, in Nice. Eighty something people crushed dead by a uh, uh, driver of a truck. Uh, something, of course, uh, which we have a hard time to, to process, uh, especially uh, in these moments when uh, it looks as uh, the all-out violence unleashed uh, over the world at large uh, leaves us with almost no, nothing worth saving. Uh, is, is there still anything to salvage? Uh, is a question that is raised only by what ha has happened in Nice, what happened in France uh, during the whole last year, and even more importantly, what has been inflicted over multiple parts of the world for long centuries, uh, tragedies which have a hard time being taken as seriously as the ones we are witnessing, uh, tragedies which 
as Judith Butler uh, argues in her work, uh, are uh, difficult. Uh, we do not want to mourn in the same way we mourn others. But these are questions for another time, though, as I'm saying, they are part of this uh, drama, it seems to me. The world of ours is facing uh, how is it that we can write a story that is open-ended uh, rather than uh, one which is uh, premised on singularity. So if you want, it seems to me that these times of ours are uh, uh, cut through, shot through by this contest. This contest between, on the one hand, theological singularity, the courage of difference, the practice of bordering, uh, creating, manufacturing, inventing borders, um, with its political implications, the quest for purity, and the dream, ultimately, of a singular future, that, on the one hand, that constellation, and on the other hand, the acknowledgement of the irreducible multiplicity of possible uh, futures. The, if you want to put it in, uh, 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 in, a obtuse, in obtuse language, you call it the pluralized temporalities of multiple futures. Uh, if you want to put it in Spivakian uh, language. <laughs> now I mentioned Spivak, but in fact this is a very old question. Uh, in the West in particular, this is a, a question uh, that is uh, uh, central to uh, philosophical inquiry. Uh, you take someone like Labnis, uh, Labnis, this is what he was dealing with uh, in the 17th century. Um, uh, you remember, um, he provo pro proposes a set of theological justifications of uh, world futurity. Um, but a singular world futurity, uh, uh, which includes in his mind uh, an infinite number of potential worlds, uh, something rather more complex than just a simple opposition between what is open on the one hand and what is closed on the other. Uh, suggestion being that, in fact, that opposition itself has something of, uh, 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 it is somewhat simplistic and that we have to problematize the question of time, the times of the future, uh, in, uh, in, in more complex, uh, complex ways. So as a first set of uh, remarks I, I wanted to make. The second set of remarks has to do with the fact that although this is an old question uh, which we find in many different uh, articulations depending on the intellectual or philosophical tradition one is dealing with, although it is an old question, it seems to me that it has acquired uh, a new urgency. It has acquired a new urgency for different reasons. It has acquired a new urgency, first of all, because of its uh, current planetary scope and reach. So the uh, if you want me to put it differently, I'll do it this way. There is no predicament today that is devoid of a planetary dimension. Um, or put differently, planetarity, which is not the same thing as earthly or global, planetarity is our condition. This is very important, of course, especially in a place such as ours here in South Africa. Right? South Africa, basically, I mean, I won't go there, but you, you know what, what I mean. 
And, um, now, the, the very history of planetary consciousness, uh, of how we emerge to the consciousness of our condition as planetary. That history is, of course, long and, and complex. And it is worth reiterating that for most of our, most of the world, kind of world we uh, uh, belong to, come from, this consciousness came to be through a process I would like to call ecological expropriation. Which ecological expropriation, which should be taken to be the name proper of colonialism. Because what colonialism does, or colonialism or colonization, what it does, especially settler colonization, is to create an entirely new situation in which the original inhabitants of a land or of a territory are confronted with the necessity to leave a territory that has now been turned and inhabitable for them. So what I'm saying is that when you look seriously into what colonialism, colonization is all about, it's about ecological expropriation, which I define as the turning of a land we used to inhabit, uh, which is inhabitation, into a place, a home that is an inhabitable. It has to do with an inhabitability, if you want. Now, the home, what used to be a home, is no longer a home. It is a place to run away from. It is a place to run away from because it has been rendered an inhabitable as a result of having been made unsafe and risky for uh, those who used to consider it to be their home. Uh, as a result of, of the sudden or slow modification of life processes in the sense that uh, artificial human-made accidents seasonally and directly torment life. That I cannot live here because my life is permanently tormented by the forces of dissipation of life. That is what colonialism is. That's what ecological expropriation is. So, part of the new planetary consciousness that is emerging is a result of uh, not the repetition, uh, literal repetition of that original act, but its uh, dissemination uh, in various ways, um, ways so so which are invisible or made invi to be invisible and others are uh, so visible as to appear normal. So the normalization of catastrophe, if, if you want. So catastrophe becomes the mode of being and we do not consider it any longer to be uh, in any case uh, uh, scandalous, if you want. At the end of the idea of the scandal, so, uh, part of the urgency I'm talking about comes from what I have just uh, described very briefly. The second uh, reason why it is, all of what I'm talking about is urgent has to do with the fact that in the world in which we live today, it has become quasi-impossible to 
separate three things that we used to distinguish. Distinguish. We used to institute a set of. You see, I mean, our modern life is premised on a set of uh, separations, uh, originary distinctions, if you want. That this, what we call civilization, the uh, exit from a life where everyone is on everybody's as throat, the exit from that mythical state, and the entry into a state of contract, a civil state, dependent on the institutionalization of a set of distinctions or separ originary separations. For instance, the fact that nature is not the same thing as culture. Uh, the fact that I mean, is not in the purview of everybody to kill just anybody else. Um, the uh, set of taboos, like the taboo of incest, a uh, whole set of separations without which you cannot imagine a civilized or a good existence. One such set of separations had to do with the relationship between human experience, biological life, and technical system. The fact that human being is not an object. And that to a large extent, traditions of political emancipation were precisely had as their aim to make it impossible for any human being to ever be turned into an object. That our theories of alienation, that is, or disalienation, that is what they aim at, uh, uh, let's say, rendering impossible. Because capitalism as a system, as we just spoke about colonialism as ecological expropriation, capitalism, on the other hand, its natural impulse, or the French word is even better, pulsion. A pulsion is, is I think, English translation is probably tribe or something like that. It's something you can, it possesses you and you can't really control it. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the beast that capitalism couldn't have a hard time controlling was the urge to turn everything into that which could be bought and sold. And the civilizing process consists in regulating capitalism in such a way that it doesn't reach that stage. Which is no longer the case, by the way, today, which a, a, a separation which is under siege, if you want. That all those original separations today hardly ever, hardly hold any longer. In the sense that today, for many people, to be treated as an object appears to be a better alternative than to be treated as human. Because one has the feeling of having an opponent to be treated better as an object than if one was treated as a human being. So those are the uh, inversions we are uh, uh, witnessing, and the blurring of uh, fundamental foundational separations, our age is suffused, saturated with, all of which are driven to a large extent by three factors. On the one hand, the, uh, for lack of, of a better term, the financialization of the economy, the fact of its accelerated abstraction, the uh, uh, progress which otherwise we are witnessing in terms of the invention of, of new technologies, and uh, both uh, being put in the service of new forms of militarism. Those three factors are uh, accelerating the uh, dismantling of these originary separations which have 
allow us uh, to 